Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. Terrorism backer Pakistan has killed a once thriving Indo-Pak cricket rivalry. China's growing influence in South Asia and the West raises security concerns. And Pakistan desperate to turn young Indians into drug addicts. Team India playing a cricket match in Pakistan? The mere mention of this proposal is enough to elicit disbelief and incredulity. How can India, a victim that has lost more of its people to Pakistan sponsored terrorism than to any hazard, any crisis or any war engage in a sports contest on Pakistani soil? India has unequivocally stated on several occasions that Team India would not entertain an India-Pakistan match on Pakistani territory, no matter how much the country pleads, provokes or even threatens. Join us as we discuss why Pakistan is responsible for the near demise of the India-Pak cricket rivalry and why, despite their threats and provocations, Pakistan is set to lose a whole lot more than the privilege of hosting a few cricket matches. The Pakistan Cricket Board, PCB, has threatened to boycott the 2023 Cricket World Cup, slated to be held in India in October and November, if the Indian cricket team doesn't visit them for the Asia Cup in September. A desperate Pakistan Cricket Board has also attempted to spin a narrative painting themselves as a victim, implying that India, the richest cricketing board globally, is wielding its monetary might by unjustly depriving the country of a level playing field. This allegation has been leveled despite a transparent administrative system in place with International Cricket Council and the ICC having the exclusive authority to make decisions. The India-Pakistan game is the biggest game in town. It's bigger than Australia-England. It's bigger than India-Australia. How can we jeopardize that by a stubbornness without reason, without explanation? India not coming to Pakistan. This statement from the PCB chairman was devoid of both facts and reason. Firstly, India has, on several occasions, said that it is Pakistan's unrelenting support of terrorism that compelled India to sever almost all trade, cultural, and have minimum diplomatic ties with Pakistan. Secondly, why would other teams who are traveling to Pakistan after a long absence perceive Pakistan as dangerous if Islamabad's agendas were directed at India alone? Some say that this statement is an example of Pakistan's textbook tactics of attempting to score brownie points with the international community. Others believe that a cash-strapped Pakistani cricket board is attempting to secure a bailout, something the country is all too familiar with. There are also reports that Pakistan is set to lose an additional $3 million if India decides to not travel for the Asia Cup. On top of all, however, is the news that the Asian Cricket Council, the regional administrative body, is exploring the possibility of shifting the tournament to another country. The Asian Cricket Council could shift the Asia Cup to another country because of the escalating turbulence in Pakistani politics, which according to many, may pose significant security challenges. Well, Pakistan is a lost cause. You know, when um, the Sri Lankan team had gone there, there was bombing at the airport and then again at the stadium. Although uh, we had a team from England going there and playing a series. But then it definitely is. Look at the turmoil that's happening at the moment because of uh, Imran Khan. So there's a lot of uncertainty and hence uh, Pakistan is in terrible, it's in shambles, the entire country is bankrupt. I mean, leave alone talking about the Pakistan Cricket Board. Instead of blaming others, in particular India, as is their pattern, Pakistan must be introspective and acknowledge that the current situation is the direct consequence of Pakistan's prolonged policy of providing platforms to terrorism. 
Pakistan, however, has not learned from past mistakes. The country is still one of the most unsafe places in the world to organize an international event. There seems to always be a number of incidents that continually undermine public safety in Pakistan. With Pakistan's track record, how could an Indian team feel secure enough to venture into Pakistani territory? Indian Foreign Minister Dr. Jai Shankar had categorically said during the recent SCO summit that India cannot establish a relationship with those who support terrorism. Victims of terrorism do not sit together with perpetrators of terrorism to discuss terrorism. Victims of terrorism defend themselves, counter uh, acts of terrorism, they call it out, they delegitimize it, and that is exactly what is happening. When evaluating India's decision, be it from an ethical standpoint, through the considerations of public sentiment and national security, or simply assessing its symbolic significance, a resolute and unambiguous no has been and should be the only response. All Pakistan is left to stare at in this situation is yet another beatdown, this time involving more than just their cricket board. Pakistan has long used narcotics to fund its terror infrastructure in the Indian subcontinent. While it has been pushing trained terrorists and also deadly arms and munitions besides fake currency, Narcotics are being pumped into the Indian territory to reach Indian markets like Punjab, Delhi, Mumbai to generate money for terror operations and recruitment. Join us as we discuss how Pakistan's drug trade employs a two-pronged strategy that on one hand it provides funding for state-sponsored terrorism and on the other it aims to introduce Indian youth to illegal substances. On many occasions, Recovery of drugs in different parts of India has made it clear that Pakistan is not only infiltrating terrorists but also pushing narcotics in the country. Pakistan-based narco-terrorist networks have stepped up their activities on the Indo-Pakistan international border and are making incessant attempts to smuggle drugs into India. Narcotics are generally trafficked into India through the border states of Gujarat, Rajasthan, Punjab, and Jammu and Kashmir. Recently in Amritsar, a man was apprehended with a drone that was being used to smuggle narcotics from across the border. Police also recovered two pistols and over one kilogram of heroin from his possession. This is not an isolated incident. There have been many cases of illegal drug trafficking from across the borders lately. More than 80% of drug flow in India comes from Pakistan. The figure is based on a survey conducted by a European agency. It reveals how Pakistan has an absolute monopoly in subcontinent's narcotics trade. The country's intelligence agencies have been working with terror groups on a kill two birds with one stone strategy to smuggle weapons and narcotics into India through the same routes. The drone attack by Pakistan on India is very serious and a matter of deep concern. In 2020, Pakistan launched 49 drone attacks on India. In 2021, it was 109. And last year, in 2022, Pakistan launched 268 drone attacks on India. Drones are very easy to use and hence is preferred by Pakistan for launching their attacks on India. The three main characteristics of drones are they are cheap to manufacture, they are unmanned, and lastly, they are not easy to be detected by radars. Hence, Pakistan has been using this drone technology in a big way against India in the last few years. Pakistan's narcotic trade is a two-pronged strategy. On one hand, it serves as a money mentor for state-sponsored terrorism. On the other, it attempts to get Indian youngsters hooked on illegal drugs. According to a recent report by the National Drug Dependence Center in Ames, over 6 lakh people in Jammu and Kashmir are victims of drug abuse. Kashmir Valley is witnessing an alarming rise in drug addiction in all socio-economic classes of the region. 
Every hour, a new drug addict inevitably enters the drug rehabilitation center in Kashmir. Only 489 cases were registered by the Government Medical College's Oral Substitution Therapy Center in Srinagar in 2016. But in 2021, that number exceeded 10,000. The security apparatus and the government of Jammu and Kashmir have both been shocked by this worrisome 2,000% increase Youth are falling prey to the gangster terrorist network because of the following reasons. Firstly, easy money given to carry out terrorist attacks. Next, radicalization of wrong beliefs. Thirdly, religious indoctrination. Fourthly, false assurances given for the betterment of life of the family in case the terrorist is arrested or killed by the security forces. Fifthly, easy availability of drugs. The cross-border smuggling of narcotics provides oxygen to terrorism via finances and if not curbed soon, could ruin the lives of the region's youth. The finances generated from drugs such as heroin fund separatists' activities and spread other centrifugal tendencies. Moreover, large-scale availability of narcotics and drugs encourages demand for narcotics and drugs by the domestic population consumption of which produces dysfunctional behavior, thereby creating law and order problems in the society. Therefore, India needs to adopt a comprehensive approach to tackle this challenge. Moving on. China has escalated its efforts to exert influence in South Asia, Central Asia and Europe. The communist country has descended to such a level that it has started disregarding international relations and boundaries of neighboring nations. More so, in guise of diplomatic treaties, China has unlawfully established its police stations in some European countries to help its citizens settle there. As per a report by Spanish Human Rights Group, Italy happens to be the home to the largest number of unofficial Chinese police stations. To know more about the rising Chinese influence in South Asia and the West and the security issues concerning the world, our colleague Ravi Khandelwal spoke to Giglio Terezi, former foreign minister of Italy. Here are some excerpts from their online conversation. Uh, Mr. Giglio, there were some reports uh, that the Chinese are operating some secret police stations uh, within Italy. So how concerned uh, uh, the government there is? I've read these reports uh, with a lot of concern, and uh, as many colleagues in the Senate, uh, and not only in the Senate, also in the other chamber, but uh, I would say in the public opinion, uh, it was an important analysis by safeguard defenders. Uh, there were uh, elements uh, that uh, gave uh, really the uh, impression that there were strong bases, I would say legal evidence, but there were strong evidence, uh, strong uh, witnesses, um, uh, examples uh, of uh, um, documenting a unofficial, unofficial presence of uh, uh, Chinese policemen in major Italian uh, cities where there are uh, significant Chinese uh, communities and expatriates. And uh, quite frankly, not only have read uh, this report, but have met a number of people in those communities who are um, telling me, uh, of course, I don't, <laughs> I'm not a policeman. I just, I can just listen. I try to listen as much as I can and to see, although I'm short-sighted with my glasses, but to, to have a look of whatever I can see. And uh, I, I know people uh, who, from the Chinese community who have told me that during the certain events, they've seen uh, persons, uh, their compatriots, uh, not dressed as policemen, for sure, which were just uh, strolling around uh, and uh, talking, chatting uh, in ceremonies, uh, and then filming those who were perhaps at the conference where somebody who was not particularly in line with the Chinese Communist Party was having the, was taking the floor. And so just to listen to somebody who says something which is not exactly the, <laughs> the truth for the uh, Chinese Communist Party, 
it is a terrible offense to national security. And uh, I don't know whether the crime is terrorism or whatever it is, but uh, it's not a good thing to be to be caught in that direction. And we know very well what is the consequence uh, when somebody, some expatriate is uh, caught in a situation like that. If he's not being deported, uh, there are uh, thousands of cases of deportation, uh, of legal deportation of people who are not in line. Uh, the member of the family who are still in China are going to suffer. How the EU, EU is observing the things happening in, in Pakistan? Because uh, there's a total chaos going on there, the political instability, economic collapse. So how do EU lose uh, what is happening in Pakistan? Pakistan uh, is, is a country of, of again, uh, great, importance, great importance for regional stability. Uh, we know how, uh, uh, how critical has always been uh, its position over the last century, uh, maybe 78, uh, seven, uh, century, century and, and, and a half, perhaps. But uh, for sure, uh, in uh, the aftermath uh, of September 11, uh, the Pakistan uh, involvement uh, in Afghanistan and uh, the difficulties that the Pakistan reality has in uh, disconnecting completely and in fighting uh, uh, an ethnic and uh, uh, geopolitical reality uh, for which it has always been, uh, it has, from time to time, there has been uncertainty about the true role of uh, Pakistani leaders in, in facing and in fighting the Taliban's in, in Afghanistan. And there have been uh, many evidences in the Northwest Territories, the Tariq al-Taliban, uh, the other groups and uh, factions, which were connected very much with Pakistan. But given Pakistani history is natural, that the, there is all, always the question mark that uh, uh, a political leader or another political leader is helped or not helped by uh, the force, the military uh, organization. It's completely a nonsense to imagine that there is no interest, a Chinese interest in, in having stability in Pakistan, because their interest, of course, there relates uh, is a traditional. Uh, alliance, per se, a traditional strategic partnership, there is no doubt, between Islamabad and Beijing. And also, uh, on that, there are other problems which pertain to the uh, Pakistan, uh, to China-Pakistan economic corridor. We know how that corridor uh, uh, is financed and what are the backdrops of the huge uh, expenditure that uh, Chinese uh, uh, purses had, had to be had to be confront. But there is also, and, and here, th there is a, another, another question. How much of the loans which are allowed, which are given for the Belt and Road or the uh, China-Pakistan China, economic corridor, how many of these funds, of these loans, are given uh, in, uh, in a framework of financial sustainability? Uh, uh, a sustainability which, we, which should be connected to uh, the growth of the uh, country which receives the loan, to the economic situation, to its finances, and how these loans have been negotiated. That is to say, under which uh, oversight, inter I mean on the international oversight. The interest for China was, above all, the guarantee they were receiving from that country. And what was the, current, the guarantee? What was the guarantee in the example that I'm making? A huge deep water seaport in the Adriatic that uh, could have a very high strategic importance for China, not only commercial importance. And they wonder whether these kind of things don't happen also in the Indo-Pacific and in the Indian Ocean. But ultimately, uh, China's plan is 
to tap the European market uh, through China-Pakistan economic corridor. So, do you believe that it will certainly impact the the markets, uh, the producers, the manufacturers uh, in, in the in Europe? Uh, no, no, I, I I don't I don't have reason to. Uh, what what is impacting uh, uh, on markets in Europe? Uh, uh, for sure, uh, is uh, a, a, an aggressive trade policy by China, uh, which runs out of uh, uh, the basic principle of reciprocity. They are saying, uh, and uh, also protection of international of, of intellectual property. That is the basic foundation of of a clean and and uh, wealthy trade relationship among uh, modern economies. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for speaking to us. Thank you very much to hosting me. Crimes committed against India and Hindus in the guise of Khalistani referendum have significantly increased, not only in India, but also worldwide. Hindu temple vandalism has witnessed spike since the start of 2023, and persons of Indian descent have been targeted in nations like Australia, Canada and the United Kingdom. Recently, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi during his visit to Australia brought up the matter of vandalism of Hindu temples in Australia. A report. Anti-India and anti-Hindu crimes by pro-Khalistanis have considerably escalated, not just in India, but all across the world in the name of Khalistani referendum. Since the beginning of 2023, Hindu temples have seen a spurt in vandal attacks and people of Indian origin have been attacked in countries like Australia, Canada and the United Kingdom. In the last four months, four Hindu temples in Australia and two Hindu temples in Canada have been vandalized and defaced with anti-Hindu and anti-India slogans. When the Australian Prime Minister visited India in March, he emphasized that his country would not take lightly any attacks on places of worship. This was the month when a major Hindu temple in the city of Brisbane, Sri Lakshmi Narayan Temple, was vandalized. The walls of the temple was defaced with graffiti by pro-Khalistani supporters. In January, two other instances were reported. The Sri Shiva Vishnu Temple in Karam Downs was painted with anti-Hindu graffiti and another temple in Mill Park was defaced with both anti-India and anti-Hindu graffiti. The Indian government has taken up this issue strongly with his Australian and Canadian counterparts. Recently, during his visit to Australia, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi raised the issue of vandalism of Hindu temples in Australia. Australia may मंदिरों पर होने वाले हमलों और अलगाववादी तत्वों की गतिविधियों के संबंध में हमने पहले भी बात की थी और आज भी हमने बात की है भारत और ऑस्ट्रेलिया के सौहार्दपूर्ण रिश्तों को कोई भी तत्व अपने विचारों या अपने एक्शन से आघात पहुंचाए the pro Khalistan separatists settled abroad are making repeated attempts to grab the attention of the world Sikh community by indulging into violence. The Indian diaspora has been continuously facing threats from such brainwashed Khalistani sympathizers who are being funded by ISI. Various organizations in Punjab have already condemned the activities of pro-Khalistan outfits and called for strict action against those propagating anti-Indian movement. In January, the Indian High Commission in Canberra issued a strongly worded denunciation of the attacks, blaming pro-Khalistan organizations like Sex for Justice. Sex for Justice is a United States-based group seeking a separate homeland for Sikhs a Khalistan in India's Punjab. As of July 2019, Indian agencies were pursuing 12 criminal cases and had detained 39 people 
associated with the Sikhs for Justices in India. And now its presence has been growing in countries like Australia and Canada with attacks on Hindus and temples growing. This is really very unfortunate uh, that uh, these Khalistani separatist elements as well as extremists and terrorists uh, from different countries have become far more active in recent times and we have seen uh, their nefarious activities playing out in India and in the Western countries, especially be it Australia, be it Canada, be it uh, UK or be it for that matter, United States of America. I think they even allowed them some kind of a thing called referendum and whatnot. I mean, these are illegal kind of things that are happening and they should be stopped by these governments. So I believe that there has been a certain kind of complicity or looking the other way by these governments, which is absolutely unacceptable because these are the kind of things that eventually are going to bite them as well. So it is important that India's territorial integrity and sovereignty must be duly respected by those nations and they must take all the actions. Although a huge force and money is being pushed in to destroy the youth and hamper peace in India, assertive vigilance and several crackdowns leading to multiple arrests, have been able to contain the anti-India activities happening at the commands of Islamabad. The new generation in Punjab has totally rejected Pakistan's malicious propaganda and has opposed any such move that divides people along lines of faith. Hence, Islamabad should now understand that it cannot achieve its goal of forming a separate Khalistan either through conventional war or through other conspiracies. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.